What we want is to raise human beings that are not burdened with the yearning to look upward, unless they are seeing in the sky some career opportunity as a commercial pilot or a server of diet cola on airplane flights. We want to remove the organ of longing for the sky, call the procedure in our anatomy or something of the sort. The sky suggests the vastness of creation and the smallness of man's ambition. It startles us out of our dreams of vanity. It silences our pride. It stills the lust to get and spend. It is more dangerous for a human soul to fall into than for a human body to fall out of. A child that has been blared at and distracted all his life will never be able to do the brave nothing of beholding the sky. From 10 Ways to Destroy the Imagination of Your Child, a satire by Anthony Esselin. Well, welcome to our bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> that was an awkward way to start this. Welcome back to Bright Hearth, everybody. We are, I said that because we have- We uh, moved homeward. We're, experience, we're experimenting <laughs> with a new recording setting. Uh, to see if we might be able to do this after the kids are in bed to make it a little bit easier on the schedule and make sure that we stay consistent with getting this podcast released. So anyway, welcome back here. I think we're on episode six and we are, of course, uh, continuing to walk through the rooms of the house in this first season of Bright Hearth. And in each room, we're basically asking what lost art of homemaking needs to be recovered here, Lexi's shifting so she can look at me. So we're, we're both leaning against the wall, like <laughs> looking at the opposite wall about each other. Hey, babe. Hi. So we are continuing in the living room. Last last episode, we talked about the necessity of beauty. And we talked about art, architecture, the recovery of um, intergenerational work, I think is good for some of the feedback from the episode. I think something that came up a couple times in conversing with some of you on Facebook and Twitter was um, just how important it is to view this work of recovering art and beauty as intergenerational. Oh, like interesting. You I didn't... might get a few paintings in your lifetime. Oh, yeah, that yeah, that's cool. Hand them down to your kids and, you know, and what would be glorious yeah. is if in three generations they were still passing some mm -hmm. of those on and collecting a, yeah, that's cool. a Sauve mm -hmm. legacy. So we're continuing today, and I think we're going to do this episode and one more in the living room. Today, we're going to talk about education mm -hmm. as an art and science and discipline of homemaking. Mm -hmm. And then in the next episode, Lord willing, we will talk about things like discipleship, training your children, and catechism, mm -hmm. which is, you know, education is a subset of discipleship, as we'll talk about. But um, so today, more about education, homeschooling, school, that sort of thing. And the next week, discipleship mm -hmm. and formation. Mm -hmm. So, um, Lexi, why don't you tell everybody, just give them kind of like a quick overview of what is our experience in education mm -hmm. um, and, um, yeah, some of the places where these ideas have been formed. So I grew up mostly homeschooled. Um, you were public school. Yep, K through 14. <laughs> yeah, I went back to public school. I was in and out sometimes, um, but I did go back full time when I was in 10th grade so that I could go to college. So I didn't even have a really normal high school experience, I guess. But um, I kind of always knew I wanted to homeschool. I think you were always in agreement with that, but I don't necessarily know if you would say you knew why or if you cared if everyone else did it. <laughs> yeah, that, the, that has definitely been something that developed as we had kids. Yeah, so, um, so we, you actually asked me to start teaching Ari to read when he was four, and I did not want to teach him to read that early, but I did, and he did really well. So um, we homeschooled for four years. I think it was that same year I started teaching him. And it was really funny because my New Year's resolution that year was to start nothing new. Like I was doing way <laughs> too much outside the house, yep. women's ministry wise. And so that year I was like, I'm not going to start anything new. Anyways, you got a hold of Douglas Wilson's A Case for Classical Christian <laughs> Education and you read it. I was also anti anti-classical education at that point i was in school uh, and school yes and school i was hardcore charlotte masoner which we'll talk about um and you rolled over in bed one night and you were like i think we should start a school <laughs> yeah i remember the moment uh, i remember exactly it was in our ogden house yes i finished uh pastor wilson's book and i was like um we're gonna start a classical christian school and i said nope yeah, I think you literally <laughs> said nope. So gentle and quiet spirit, submissive. Uh, 
but no so that i think you have literally asked me to read three books in my entire life and that is one of the three books and mm -hmm. yeah so and we'll talk because about it because she as we reads go. books on her own you guys like yeah i yeah, usually yeah. don't have to ask her but the, but no, there yeah. have been a few times where i was like no you need to read this book yeah and it wasn't uh, that was in jest i was not like trying to exert not my yet. will but i was just like you've read zero books on education and now you're telling me this is what we're doing okay to be fair it was not it was, zero books it was very humbling for me to go through this whole process which we will talk about so yeah so since then that yes. was years that was years ago yeah um and we we launched a classical christian school mm -hmm. out of our church in the academic year yeah. 2021 2022 yeah. so this year as we record this we're just rounding the final bend mm -hmm. of year one of our school i did lead a co-op at our church yeah. for one year um, and then the year after that, I just, I couldn't do it. And that was kind of when we, yeah, we just, it, COVID, COVID happened and we really right. saw the timing was right to start a school. So yep. we actually accelerated our school launch mm -hmm. plans and the Lord also provided um, Kevin Love, yeah. who's oh, now yeah. an elder at the church, mm -hmm. um, but he's also the headmaster of our yeah. school. Kevin had been uh, in the Air Force, but was medically retired. He had studied classics in his uh, he had studied age. classics and i don't know what they would have called him but like the guy that was his lead professor at the air force academy was also a charlotte mason dad yeah of a large family and so it, and he good obviously mentor. he was a christian so yeah he had a very good um understanding of yeah education so kevin was in a great uh, opportunity to be mm -hmm. able to actually move back to utah to help us yeah. start the school he had been medically retired from the air force at that point he's a young guy uh Air Force Academy graduate. Mm -hmm. And so really uh, one of the things I hope you get from this episode is that the work of education is a Christian requirement. It's not optional. Yeah. Christian education is not optional, mm -hmm. but that it's also a team effort Yeah, and that you gain more. I think one of the biggest things we'd want you to take away, whether you homeschool, um, co-op, cottage school, classical school, Charlotte Mason, private school, whatever you do with your Christian education, that you really lean into the benefit of having other people on your team. Yeah. That, Specialization. That was the one thing I wanted to say was I don't, I don't necessarily know if our readers, our readers, our listeners need to be convinced of Christian education. Of yeah. But just realizing it is a vocation God has given you. You don't have the option. Government school is not the option. Right. So we're going to talk, let's talk, we're going to talk about that um, first, actually. So let's talk about, um, what are the options for mm -hmm. edge? Obviously everybody should agree that you need to educate your children, right? That <laughs> Your children should be able to read and think well, you want your children to be able to read well, think well, write well, speak well, to be able to go out and do their, um, you know, pursue whatever vocational calling the Lord yeah. gives them, whether in the, the economic sphere or in the yeah. home. Um, and uh, we're going to also talk about education, not just being to get kids a good job, but, yeah. We've got a lot of options in that range. Mm -hmm. um, what is permissible, in our view, for a Christian in most situations, and excluding mm -hmm. all of the, but what about the you know, single mom in mm -hmm. New York City who <laughs> works as a waitress and her children yeah. are you know, babysat by a Ninja Turtle in the day. <laughs> okay. Like just in a normal, let's say two yeah. parents situation, yeah. hopefully husband's providing, wife's yeah. able to be home. Like We don't want the outliers to set the norms. We're talking about the normative yeah. situation yeah. for Christians. Titus 2, the mother's pursuing being an oiko despot, a worker mm -hmm. at home. Husband is providing for his family so that he yeah. doesn't deny the faith and prove worse than an unbeliever. Yeah. So given that, mm -hmm. what are the permissible and impermissible in our view uh, methods of education okay well i would just say like the father is responsible for seeing that his children are brought up in the paideia and nuthesia of the lord so you might want to explain those two concepts a little bit more yeah but i feel like understanding those allows you to see that you have lots of options for what tools as a father you can employ be it your wife using living books or using hopefully not dead boxed curriculum, but um, just using really quality homeschool material, or you might have a Christian tutor that you hire, or you might do some online Christian academies, or you might open a school or you might open a 
cottage school or you might start a co-op. So it just depends on what like the Lord is calling your family to specifically. But I think if it falls, this is how I've always thought about it, at least if it falls outside of the realm of Paideia and Nuthesia, it's a no-go. Yeah, Paideia and Nuthesia are two Greek words that are used by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And in that chapter, it's one of Paul's household codes where he's going through the duties of the various people in the household. You know, husbands do this, wives do this, children do this. And he tells fathers, um, fathers, raise your children up, or don't provoke your children to wrath, but raise them up in the Paideia and Nuthesia of the Lord. And it's translated variously discipline and instruction or some other set of words. Paideia and Nuthesia um, together really give you the idea, particularly if you see how the word Paideia is used in literature, even outside of the New Testament during this period. Mm-hmm. Um, it should, you know, it's a very thick word. It means like the total enculturation of an adult citizen of Rome, for yeah. example. Anybody, well, any male, any male in Rome could be called upon to serve in political office. It's a yeah. little bit different from how we do it here in the U.S., but because of that, any every male needed to be educated so they were educated they understood every single thing that they were interacting with was educating them for the kingdom of rome yes so as a christian we should be understanding everything our child is interacting with is educating them for god's kingdom and just like the roman is going to be an active participant in the roman culture right the christian is going to be an active participant in the christian church yes so paideia if you take that concept of raising a male citizen of Mm -hmm. Rome in the Paideia of Rome, Mm -hmm. and then you see how Paul uses it. And he says, raise your children. And he doesn't just say boys, by the way. He says, your children, which would have included sons and daughters, in the Paideia and Nuthesia. And Nuthesia is a very, like, instructive, didactic word. So it's like a teaching, teaching kind of word um, in the the Paideia and Nuthesia of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So now he's talking about the total formation of a child. Some of the other principles that are important to understand uh, in in this conversation, you know, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna I'm gonna sum up like permissible and permissible in a minute here. Um, Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke that when someone is fully trained, they will be like their teacher. So it's very important for for Christian parents to understand that out of the mouth of Christ. Who you employ to teach your children is just as important as what they're teaching your children and what the pedagogy or the philosophy of education is. So why? Because they're not just going to become, you know, they're not just going to come to agree with the information that the teacher is sharing with them. They're actually going to be impressed with the mold of their teacher. Um, I, I can't remember in, in uh, I took a class from New St. Andrews on the history of classical Christian education and um, there was a quote. I, I'll see while I'm while I'm talking. I'll pull it up um, from our website. Uh, our our oh, St. Brendan's. Website, St. Brendan's. Oh, okay. Yeah, St. Brendan's. Dot Academy, I think, is what it is. Um, but he, this author or this um, classical educator, is what it was. Compare. I, it was Hugh of St. Victor. I don't need to look it up. Hugh of St. Victor said that. In the process of education, our children are like, or the student is like a wax, soft wax, and the teacher himself is like a seal. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the ring of a nobleman sealing a letter to say, this is from the king. He pushes that ring into the soft wax, and he imprints himself on it, is Mm -hmm. is the idea. This is a very biblical idea. So um, what we would say if you study, and we're not going to like show all, I've preached whole sermons on this. You can see them on St. Brandon's Academy. I preached a sermon that's up there um, on education. We would say, and we would argue from good and necessary consequence of Scripture, that right now public school in the vast majority of cases is an impermissible method, the government school for a Christian to educate their child. Including charter schools because they're government yeah, schools. Yeah, any government school. You know, a, people a, always say, "Oh, that's a Christian a charter, charter school." school. You're like, no, no. <laughs> it can't be. It literally can't be. It's by law. It cannot teach. You know, there was a school that popped up in our area, and it was like, "We're and a Christian charter school." They wouldn't let school. you teach Bible because yeah. you hadn't been to seminary. It was pretty funny. They had to teach it. They had to teach the Bible as literature, basically. Mm-hmm. So they couldn't teach it as the inerrant word of God. The reality is, 
all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ Jesus, mm-hmm. according to Colossians. The fear of God is the beginning of not just wisdom in the Proverbs, but the fear of God is also the beginning of knowledge. So that means that if you are to properly know anything, you must fear the Lord to, to both know anything. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's also the beginning of wisdom, which is knowing what to do about knowledge, right? Not just knowing things, but what to do about knowing things. So if you really understand a biblical doctrine of things like epistemology, how you, how you know things, of you know, the realities of um, enculturation and the enculturation process of a teacher teaching a student— Uh, you should conclude that it would not be permissible for a Christian parent to say, yeah, my plan for educating my child, like let's say 30 to 40 hours a week, my plan is to send them, uh, yeah, like how many, nine months a year, 30 to 40 hours a week, to send them to a non-Christian who by law is not allowed to teach them about the Lordship of Christ as it relates to any point of knowledge on the curriculum. And... Um, not only that, but in a place that is increasingly filled with some of the vilest sexual perversions. Violence, even. It's very unsafe to send kids to public schools nowadays. We recently had an elder at our church. He was driving um, some kids to a a church event, I think, that were like family friends or something. And the, the family friends had brought along one of their friends, maybe like a junior high age student. And they were talking about how how many furries there were in the oh, school. Oh, yes. And Dan was like, oh, I just gave it away. It was Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bleep that out. Uh, he, he was like, what's a furry? And, and they were like, you've never heard of a furry? He's like, no. And they said, don't Google it. That was the first thing. Because a furry is somebody who identifies as an animal or they dress up as an animal character and it has sexual ramifications too. It's, it's utterly oh, vile. Oh, gosh. You're, you're talking about in high schools and junior highs where mm-hmm. cl- in classes of 30 students, you might have 10 of them that identify as mm-hmm. bisexual or lesbian or gay. Mm-hmm. So we would argue, and, and we haven't even argued yet. We've just given you an overview. And yeah, we this... won't in this episode. But we would argue that mm-hmm. public school, the government schools are not permissible methods for Christians to deploy in educating their children. And so we would argue that the principle that everybody should agree on in the church is that children should be given a Christian education Mm -hmm. by Christian teachers who are worthy of emulation and and whom you would want to say to your child, become like this person, not just receive their teaching. Mm -hmm. So, But what that means is that we are for, Lexi and I, I mean, we're for... Christian education in homeschools, mm-hmm. Christian education in cottage schools, which are like, if you've never heard of that, it's like two days a week in a formal classroom, mm-hmm. three days a week in a homeschool type environment sort of thing. Um, Christian private schools, mm-hmm. Christian with Charlotte Mason, Christian with classical, Christian with, like we're for Christian education and we have our convictions about the particulars mm-hmm. that we would want to argue to somebody mm-hmm. to agree with us. But at the end of the day, and we tell this to our church all the time, if you are a homes, Christian homeschooler mm-hmm. who does some slightly different model than we do, mm-hmm. we are for you, and we absolutely don't want to form in our church, for example, mm-hmm. a cult of kids who go to St. Brendan's and then yeah. kids who are homeschooled. We, we're all on the same page. The principle is Christian education. Okay, so let's talk now about some of the methodology and, and principles of education that provided you agree on that principle of Christian education being at the bottom. Mm-hmm. What are some really important principles and, um, you know, even like pedagogy is a word we talk about, which is like the, uh, the philosophy of teaching and education. What are some principles and big, big ideas that you would want to give a parent who's saying like, maybe I've got young kids. Yeah. They're, we're going to start, whether we're homeschooling or something else, we're going to be educating them. Education is going to be happening in the home. Mm-hmm. What kind of things would you say every parent should get to recover the lost art of education in homemaking? Mm-hmm. Um, I just immediately think of, I don't think this is maybe the most important, but the biggest game changer for me was that children are born persons. Yeah. And it kind of changed. I mean, maybe we do need to talk about this a little bit because you and I aren't even the type of classical that most people would assume when they hear the word classical. So, um, that we're influenced by some Charlotte Mason. Yes. Stuff too. When I guess when I hear the word classical, I, I more think of 
we're just recovering our Christian heritage of education. We're not just this one type of classical that's like rote memorization trivium. Oh, Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, sure. We're we're not and and St. Brandon's the school that we started yeah. isn't um necessarily like straight down the line. No. We wouldn't ag- agree necessarily with the idea of the classical trivium yeah. of grammar, logic and rhetoric being applied to child development stages. Mm-hmm. That's more of a modern idea. Um Dorothy Sayers in 1940 mm-hmm. in her Lost Tools of Learning yeah. essay or you know speech she wasn't it, it, she that's really not a historic she makes some claims that are actually historically inaccurate in that in that speech so we're for the trivium as subjects and as yeah. you know training tools but um we wouldn't like want to say children in the grammar stage are going to memorize a ton of stuff and then children yeah. in, so so we're not necess- we're we're kind of like a hybrid mm-hmm. between or even i would say like going a little bit further back in yeah. The oh, pedagogy. totally. Totally. Yeah. Then, then totally. so much of the modern class. But approach. Charlotte Mason is a Christian, so she is a part yeah. of that Christian heritage yeah, that we definitely, have. Definitely. Definitely. So that's why children I, are persons. There, is her. there is a divide in the Charlotte Mason and classical world that it's sure. not possible for them to be the same. But and I'm we sorry, want them to get along. It is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, so and they get along in our school. So for me, that was life changing for everything. I remember reading. This is kind of connected. I I was reading. Elizabeth Elliot's essay on femininity in Piper and Grudem's book on biblical manhood and womanhood, where she where she was quoting Lewis, who said that we adhere to our God given sex, male and female, not because it's practical, but because it's a God given revelation. And when I realized that, it dawned on me how efficiency minded I was being in every area. But coupling that with Charlotte Mason and understanding that children are born persons, it totally, it changed everything about how I was yeah. parenting, I think. And I think Ira was maybe one or a little baby when that, when I read that. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really huge is understanding they are born with a God-given personality, God-given gifts. Um, understand that as you're educating them, you're not first trying to just pour stuff into them. Yeah. God did make them a certain person. <laughs> Yeah, when we say children are persons, we mean that they're not like um, they're not an unformed substance mm-hmm. that you pass every child through the exact same process, mm-hmm. correct? And it will stamp on them the correct. exact same thing, correct? Children are not another way that I've heard it put. Actually, by James K. A. Smith, who's totally a flaming liberal that you should not listen to. But years ago, he wrote a book that I read, and it was actually there was some yeah, it was stuff good. In it. Um, Again, I would not recommend him, but he's, he basically was talking about how children are not brains on a stick. They're mm-hmm. not USB drives mm-hmm. is another way you could think about this. That you just, you plug a USB drive in, you drag and drop some files of education onto them. Yeah. No, education is the education of persons. Yeah. It's training. It's formation. It's it, what we're actually trying to do in education and Christian education certainly is not just to impart a certain body of knowledge, though mm-hmm. that is part of it. We're actually trying to make virtuous Correct. Christians. And cultivating affections and Yes. You affections. Know, ordering their that. affections. Um yeah. talk a little bit about that. What does that mean? Ordering their affections. I just think it means like giving them a love for God's world. Mm-hmm. For, like almost recovering Christian humanism in a way, like loving loving it for the sake of it instead of yeah. loving it to tear it apart and analyze it or loving so, it to get money from it yeah or to get yes a job yes yes it. yeah so this is another um one of the things i learned from charlotte mason was synthetic knowledge versus analytical knowledge like i i want my child to be interacting my child is learning when he is walking up and observing the chickens in the chicken coop i don't have to sit down and read him a book so in some ways as a homeschool mom that lessens your load in a way because you're yeah. understanding like God can use all of these things to teach my child. Yeah. Um and it's actually really amazing when you when you then go to sit down and to actually formally study a topic how much they have learned and observed. Yeah. Um what is the, those two synthetic knowledge and you mentioned those what what do those mean? Um and okay so Oh, what is that? And I'm book? not you don't have to like web webster Karen Glass yet. has a really really good book about this. Um I can't remember what it's called. It's actually funny because she's, I think in that book, if I remember correctly, she's arguing that Charlotte Mason cannot be classical, but she had, she has a fabulous section on there in there about synthetic versus analytical. Like when you um, are tearing apart a flower, like every part of a flower, 
Uh-huh. If you're just studying it in its small pieces, but you've never experienced it, you could pass right by a flower in would, the garden and not know what it is because you be analytical knowledge. Correct. Yeah, Tearing like you're it apart, analyzing, understanding it. its constituent parts. Yes. So, um, just like having a more holistic view of the way they're learning instead of just assuming that they're only learning when they're sitting in a desk, sort of mm-hmm. a thing. Yeah. Um, and the other, there was another principle from Mason earlier that I forgot. <laughs> one, one thing we're going to talk about. So every, every main show we, we record, we also sit down and record a shorter episode called in the kitchen that we release just for patrons. And in this episode, we're going to talk about the problem of effeminacy in education, because one of the problems you get whether and this happens in schools and homeschool environments is that they tend to be geared for girls. Mm-hmm. And they also tend to be dominated by women. So we're going to talk about how we've aimed to combat that in our school mm-hmm. and also how we think about that in the home. So if you, if you want access to that, you can, there's a link in the, in the description, but it's patreon.com slash bright hearth. And we do one of those for every show. So we'll talk about that in there. Um, so let's, that that's really good because children are persons is such an important principle mm-hmm. and, and it's not, again, this is something that arises from the scriptures is yes, that if you yeah. understand a biblical anthropology, Correct. biblical doctrine of persons of man, you will conclude these sort of things. You can't already. even, um, who was a uh, horse man. I mean, he has these disgusting quotes on how we need to view people as machines. The machine must take the place of the human. The human yeah. must die essentially. And he is like who so much of our American education system is built on. And, and I don't even understand how a Christian could then argue to be pro public education because they don't even believe in the people that they're saying they're educating. Like, yeah. So Christian anthropology is a big deal. The other thing I was going to say is living books. Yep. Yeah. So living books over textbooks. Textbooks are not necessarily bad. I probably use, have used in, in our schooling more textbooks than a lot of Charlotte Mason people would be okay with, but that, the end goal should never be a textbook. <laughs> right. Um, and I even remember when we were using Logos, which was, it was good in some ways. I always wanted to do Ambleside, but you were a little sketch with Ambleside for a while. So we tried some Logos. But when, when I did start incorporating more of the Charlotte Mason Ambleside books and you heard me reading them, you were like, this is what it is? Yeah. This is way better than I ever imagined it could be. Yep. So, um, and it's really hard. I, I get, I understand that we have different personalities and as somebody who is teaching multiple students full time, I understand that you really do have to pick curriculums that play to your strengths, especially if you're in hard seasons. I've homeschooled on bed rest before. I've had multiple newborns. I've homeschooled through moves. Different um, kids with different strengths. <laughs> correct. Like we've had, uh, we, you know, we have one boy that's like very academically gifted. Yeah early reader especially for a boy Mm -hmm. we have another boy who's like much more classic boy yeah (laughs) not as much he's not an early reader Mm -hmm. so before we move on Mm -hmm. what is a living book you said that phrase yeah tell us what that means what is a living book i would say that it's written by somebody who's actually very passionate about the subject they're writing about a lot of the time too what's characteristic of mason's books i'd say probably before high school is they're telling you information in the, in the setting of a story instead of like, let's sit down and learn about all of the spiders today. And we're just going to list all the facts and we're going to have one yeah. picture, you know, like a typical encyclopedia picture. Uh, a living book would then do an entire story about the different spiders and, and what their different characteristics are and the characteristics will play into the story and the plot yeah. and all that stuff. So two, two examples mm-hmm. I, I, that I give you to like help you wrap your head around the difference here. The difference between a, a modern geometry textbook and yeah. Euclid's geometry Correct. is the difference between it. And, and especially in something like mm-hmm. geometry, you're probably going to use a curriculum that has more textbook elements. Yeah. But another example maybe even would be, um, you know, in our school, we would like instead of our children to read a textbook on World War II mm-hmm. or um, the history of the 20th century, where an author is supposedly in a textbook, and yeah. I say supposedly, boiling down the brute facts, taking <laughs> fact units from all these other sources and putting them in an unbiased <laughs> guide to this period. It's farce because mm-hmm. they're, it's made by a human. It is not unbiased. In mm-hmm. fact, it's very biased. Textbooks are extraordinarily biased. Rather, what we would have our students do is they will read 
Winston Churchill's memoirs of the Second World War. That's what I was okay. going to say is a so lot. So we've got, you know, Winston Churchill giving you his as a key actor in, mm-hmm. the, in the actual events. He's giving you his account of, of the Second World War. But as we read that, we're teaching them this is not an unbiased account. Churchill, he plays fast and loose with some of the facts to make himself look good. He glosses <laughs> over some of the... And they're it, learning even in that as they start to understand that they're also learning. So along with that, we would pair it with a book like Pat B- or Buchanan's book on the Unnecessary War. So then you're getting another picture of Churchill mm-hmm. and of uh, FDR and of some of the events that were happening in that time. So the goal isn't that any one book is going to give them the unbiased clinical definitive facts yeah. about the events. It's that, A, we want them to be interested in the events through the people, their human stories. And then we want them to be able to critically engage with these resources and ask questions of the text like, okay, who is writing this? What agenda might they have? And you, what you, what you figure out as you do that is you actually figure out, A, how to be interested yeah. in God's world and the story he's writing in history. But you also figure out how to think critically and how to see through arguments and understand trajectories. And there's so much that's happening. One more thing, and then I'm going to stop because I know you have stuff to say too. But um, I would say that uh, one thing that you figure out that we would say is a very important principle of education, whether you're homeschooling, college school, home, public, uh, private school, not public, um, would be that, and it goes along with living books. Because children are persons, if you give them really good books and materials, they will all interact with those materials as themselves. So you give all of my kids the exact same book. They're different ages or read it to the ones that can't read, Mm -hmm. different strengths. Some are boys, some are girls. They're all going to draw away different things from it. And that is success. The goal Mm -hmm. isn't to teach them to distill 10 key facts from the book. The goal is for them to read it, we teach them a principle called narration, mm-hmm. where they would then, in their own words, restate what they've summarized and restate what they've read. And what you'll find is that, like in the classrooms at St. Brendan's, four high schoolers will read the same passage, and they'll all interact mm-hmm. with it as themselves. Yeah. And we're not trying to lead them to one correct answer, you know, in that discussion. We want them to be interested in the material. In the book, Norms and Nobility, which is a fabulous book on education if you can get your hands on it he talks about how scholarly thinking is being able to connect across different um subjects so something you might be reading in in science might make you think of something else in history that you're connecting or you're finally like Mm. a light bulb goes off and it's those are the sort of things that you can't you can't test for on a standardized test (laughs) no some of our testing is like tell me everything you know about correct you know the the whatever this greek <clears throat> fable that you heard mm-hmm. yeah uh, and then as a parent whose kids are in the school now <laughs> like i go i go listen to their reviews from from mrs sanders and it's like what did ira say about this and he's narrating the uh, allegory of the cave <clears throat> it was crazy there were mormons involved <laughs> there are no mormons so in funny. the allegory of the cave he was connecting all sorts of things and at his age great i we yeah. don't care that he got six you know that he got some facts wrong. Mm -hmm. He was connecting things in his mind in this crazy Ira way. He was listening to Plato, you guys. He was listening to Plato, (laughs) you know? So I think this is another principle that we could mention. And let's talk about this. Twaddle, not patronizing your kids in education. Not talking down to them. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I just think most people don't, they're not talking to their kids on a regular basis because they want, they're kind of pacifying the time instead of looking for ways to actively engage their children. Um, and this is a little bit easier sometimes when you do have one or two kids to be actively engaging them, but obviously don't, well, I, I have very fussy standards for books. I, I almost with, yeah, died when we got the Hardy Boys. <laughs> Did you really? See, that I was, was like, like an integral I part really of my love childhood. Ari. You can read this, but this is twaddle. <laughs> I disagree that Hardy um, Boys is twaddle. No, I For know. For the listener. Yeah, there are, there are I, certain things that are like, okay, this is quintessential boyhood. You have to read this. It's not the best of the best, but because he does read things like Mark Twain on a regular basis. He reads the Swiss Family Robinson. Yeah, he Mark has Twain. lots of stuff that he loves. Yeah. I will let the Hardy Boys slide. 
<laughs> um oh i'm so offended right <laughs> now you guys i grew up i read voraciously as a child so like i read all the hardy boys i read everything i get my hands on i had like the most ar points in the entire school it was ridiculous but... i've just noticed that as we've <laughs> given our kids quality music i notice it so much with music they yeah. cannot stand although ira did discover screamo last week which was bad oh but yeah. they cannot stand crap music they know yeah. the difference um, ari was like this music is bad <laughs> Can you turn on some classical the other day? I can't remember. And it, honestly, he was wrong. It was like some bluegrass or folk. So it yeah. was actually just a, it was still a good genre mm -hmm. of real music. It wasn't like 50 cents. Just pop. But he's something. like kind of a snob about music now. Um, But no, he, the he same really, thing with he's not books. Being a snob. Like you just, your palate, I don't know. They, it's just cultivated and it's primed for quality. And so you can just be more efficient then with your education in a way because you're not having to like unlearn spongebob yeah. squarepants <laughs> maybe we could draw it back to this principle again of saying if you understand what a child is mm -hmm. what a human being is and what they're made to do which think about this human being was made for god they were mm -hmm. made to to partake be partakers of the divine nature as yeah. peter says so one thing you can take to the bank is that you should not talk down to your children yeah you shouldn't be giving them like little kitty versions of everything well think about like we believe that our children are actual heirs alongside of us. Yeah. And so like the Kings and the Queens throughout history from a very young nursery age, they were be being raised up, given a very unique education as future royalty that other members in society did not get. And that's what we should be doing when we're interacting with our child. We should be understanding like this is literally, this is a spiritual being who can interact with ideas at very young ages. At high levels. At very high levels. And so that should be changing the way yeah. we're talking to them, what we're reading to them, what they're listening to, what they're memorizing, that they can memorize things, that they can sit through church, like all yeah. of it. We give them really high quality materials. Mm -hmm. We let them interact with them. At their age appropriate at ways. At their age appropriate yeah. ways, yeah. And, and we don't, like this is, a, we've mentioned narration. This is so key. Mm -hmm. We're in not distilling. We're not teaching to a test. This is one of the no. big problems with modern um, pedagogy is that because it does not treat children as persons, it treats them as cogs or mm -hmm. unformed substances, tabula rasa, John Locke, mm -hmm. Jean-Jacques Rousseau. These are some of the foundational thinkers that formed modern education. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of the ways that um, the, the philosophies of these men. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was very much influenced by Lockean ideas of the blank slate, that children are like blank slates that, you, that society writes on, that that people are all um, good morally, and that we're, you know, so society is what corrupts them. So we just give them the right information. Education is the salvation. Education is salvation. Yeah. Whereas Christians, we're saying, no, we're... we're um, discipling Christians. Mm -hmm. Education is a subset of Christians. Mm -hmm. Our our kids were we're taught in scripture relentlessly to treat our children like Christians mm -hmm. and treat their education as discipleship. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that what we're doing is we're actually we're not trying to get them to regurgitate back to us a set of facts that we predetermined are the quote unquote important facts about mm -hmm. a story or an event or whatever. We're trying to teach them how to think well. I use this this phrase all the time, how to read well, think well, speak well, write well, right? And be a virtuous man. Be a good man who can read well, write well, speak well, think well. Because what they're going to be able to do then is they can go do anything. They can learn anything. Yeah. They can yes. go pursue their You're, interests as a you've person. You've given them the tools to continue they have to the tools. Well, because you think about it. I mean, we know the statistics about like the average person that graduates high school reads like maybe 0.5 books a year. Yeah. <laughs> they're not educating themselves anymore. They're done. Right. They're yeah. checking out on Netflix every single night. They're not thinking anymore. They're just, they're just receiving passively information from other people. The other thing you should them. add to that list is that they can rest well. Because Missy Wingler always said that on her yeah, Sabbath weeks good. from homeschool, which she would, I think she'd homeschool six weeks and then take the seventh off. And she always said she knew if she was schooling well because they were interested humans on their rest. They weren't yeah. asking for movies all the time. Yeah, and I don't mean that as a holistic everything. I mean, like that. those four categories um, are, capture a, a lot of the goals of education, not all, uh, because we're also trying to make people who are wise, who, yeah. are, um, who know 
how to they know what they're for so they know like yeah because there's lots of people that aren't super like into books but they're very wise because they know how to apply god's word yeah to lots of things and even those people we want them to be able to read well think well write well speak well Mm -hmm. uh, because that's going to be you know words one of the things that separates people from animals Mm -hmm is that we're made in the image of the Logos, the, the God-man, the Word. Yeah. And we're able to use words. And mm-hmm. we, we think we, we're all to receive verbal revelation from God and know it. And we are all to be people of the book. We're mm-hmm. all to be people who, you know, interact with words in that way. So um, I think that's really important, understanding narration, giving them living books. Um, in terms of principle, too, um, one of the things that that you talked about, I think it was really interesting that is important as well, is thinking of your children are being taught to rule well, mm-hmm. right? To be uh, through much of the history of Christian education in in the in the world too. This wasn't just Christian education, but if you like, if you study the the history of classical education in the Christian West, most of it was reserved for the clergy and the nobility. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until the, the Protestant Reformation that led to some, some early Christian theologians who then worked in the philosophy of education um, who opened up and said, well, because of the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, this Protestant, very Protestant correction of some of the Roman Catholic errors, mm-hmm. we would say, um, that surrounded vocation and laity clergy distinctions, they said, no, all children should be educated. They should all be able to read. They should all be able to think uh, in these ways. And so it was such a staunch part of Protestant Reformed doctrine that when the Puritans got to America before the founding in the 1600s, the Puritans, they, they passed the first public education, basically, the first universal community education law. It was called the Old Deluder Satan Act. And it was basically worded, so that Satan can't deceive our children, all of them should be educated to the point where they can read the scriptures for mm-hmm. themselves. So it's like all these things are deeply theological, and the liberals and the pagans have hijacked them mm-hmm. from us and convinced us that unless the pagan secular state educates our children, nobody will or could. And it's like, no, we came up with this stuff, yeah, and we're teaching them all of that to circle back. We're teaching them in, this, in the stream of the Proverbs, which was wisdom for kings, young men to grow up to rule, Solomon's sons to, to be royalty in Israel. We're, we want to teach our children so that all of them are, um, again, like even reaching back to that Roman idea of the paideia, that a Roman, any Roman male, mm-hmm. landowning male, could be a political ruler. He could sit in, in the Senate. Even our daughters, too, because... <laughs> yeah, we want all of our children to be able... All of them. ...to uh, step into that work that kingly work and that yeah. queenly work i'm pretty convinced most of the reason that lots of women leave the home to go get a job is because it's easier because they haven't been taught any sort of like thorough discipline in terms of work yeah. or like i think about this all the time the in the iliad when one of the husbands is coming back from war and he's like we meeting his baby for the first time and he's about to leave and he knows he's probably going to die and his wife is like what do we do and he just says like you man your post i man mine in the world yeah. will keep going yeah that has helped so many times and it's it's because i read a book and god sparked this living idea in my head and it allowed me to maintain my post and to be steadfast and to not give up and not flee the home you, you know you connected it to a bunch of other you made yeah. connections why don't we why don't we sum some things up with okay Okay, <clears throat> finishing the sentence, you have succeeded in education if blank. And I'll give you an example. Um, I think you've succeeded in education in the home if your children grow up to be the type of person you'd be interested to have a conversation with. Mm-hmm. That's one, one measure. Mm-hmm. What else do you think? If they can cheerfully obey you and the Lord and do their duties. Yep. If they know how to obey, do their duty with Cheerfully. cheer. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of these ideas that they're going to be learning about are the fuel for yeah. going back and obeying the Lord. I think you've succeeded in your duty in educating your children if they view the world as full of good work to be done and not a place where they need somebody to give them a job. <laughs> 
because one of the biggest errors boomers make, I mean, I'm sorry, people make, <laughs> and thinking about education is like, um, if I send my child to your school, um, will they be uh, able to yeah. be an engineer? What's at, your college uh, prep like? Grumman? It's like, listen, <laughs> listen, education is not pragmatically for no. the sole end of getting your child a, a gainful employment. If you do a good job aiming for much bigger of a goal than that, of making a virtuous person, virtuous self-ruled Christian who's interesting and interested in the world, of course they're going to be able to get a mm -hmm. good job. They're probably going to hire 50 people. Like they're probably going to start their own thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll be a great employee and a great employer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So you've succeeded, I think, if you mm -hmm. make someone who looks out at the world and they say, wow, God has made this huge wild world and he's called us to take dominion and tame it and cultivate it. And so there's a lot of work to be done. I could turn a profit anywhere. I think you've also succeeded in educating your children if they know how to tackle new bodies of knowledge or skills that they yes. know nothing about yet and they're so not important. scared of them of the mess so important if they can go man i don't know anything about medicine uh 2020 all of a sudden medicine seems to be really important let's figure this out lexi's now laid down completely <laughs> horizontally this is like great she's slowly going to sleep. I, she's like it's 8 40. i'm not I'm sure going if to podcasting sleep. is my forte after this seven is so funny this is awesome you guys can't see it so i have to be your eyes <laughs> all my friends know oh, me are like yeah not like, surprised yeah, at all 8 40 wow it's late for her um <laughs> you've succeeded at let me let me circle back explain a little bit what i mean by interesting because one of the things dan and i pastor dan and I and he's on the board of St. Brendan's as well. We talk about a lot with as we have discussed in board meetings, like educational decisions and things like that in school. We're like, will this make these students when they grow up be a more interesting person to get a beer with? Because I mean, it's like it's one of those little heuristic tests that you can run. If someone would not be an interesting person to converse with, it probably means they're not trained well. Yeah, I don't care if they're an introvert or an extrovert. Yeah, are they in like? If you are interested in the world that God made, and you should be if you're a Christian, then you will end up being an interesting person. Because well, you'll be able to be like, I, I was thinking the other day, and I read this, and I was looking at beetles, or I was looking what's at What's that proverb you always quote about, it's to God's glory to oh, yeah. conceal a matter into a king's glory to it's One of my favorite it? proverbs, and I can't remember the That's reference. That's what I now. always think of when I think of um, yeah. raising interested humans. He says, it's the, um, I sometimes get the wisdom glory. It's the... It's the glory of God to conceal a thing. It's the wisdom of kings to search it out. And mm -hmm. it might be it's the wisdom of God to conceal the glory of kings to search it out. But it's like God has made this intricate world. And Think I, about this. I, sorry. God made a world where people were meant to figure out that if you melted sand and got silica out of it, you could make chips and mm -hmm. end up making a computer with it. And no one figured that out for like thousands of years, but God knew it was there the whole time. And then some king with wisdom figured it out. Like the whole world is full of that stuff. Yeah, this is why population is a myth. Yes. Yeah, like population. overpopulation. That's garbage. Yeah, someone's going to figure out how to desalinate seawater and someone's going to figure out fusion energy and then we'll have like unlimited sunlight energy. Someone will figure out. It's just like. I think part of why we cannot, we're boring people is because we haven't, we are like three generations removed from a true Christian worldview. And once you start digging back into the past in older literature, you see it everywhere. Like you can't unsee the Christian worldview connections the authors are making. And once you see that, it's addictive and you want to go deeper and deeper yeah. and deeper and deeper down the rabbit holes to where yeah. you're like me and you're just sitting in piles of books and you're like having to reconcile the fact that I I just won't finish it all. And I feel this is insatiable. Yep. <laughs> I think we've succeeded in education if our children could give us really good uh, recommendations of a fictional story to read to a six-year-old that would also be interesting to a 50-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've succeeded in education if our children would never buy one of those signs at Hobby Lobby that says, eat, pray, love, or whatever. <laughs> I think we've succeeded in education if our children understand that... Um, it is that um, obedience is better than sacrifice. Like there's so many of these things you, you need to start. We're going to start landing the plane because Lexi's at literally horizontal right now. But <laughs> I think it's important that you start asking these sorts of questions about education so that you can reverse engineer the methodology 
Yeah. Yeah, to, that's a to good not point. produce mere efficiency and pragmatism. And so you can evaluate curriculum and books when you're looking at them and problem yes. solving and troubleshooting. Yeah. Is this a living book? So summing it up, Christian education is the principle. We should all agree on our children should have Christian education from Christians that we would want them to become like. Yeah, because not all Christian schools are the same. Not all Christian schools, not all homeschooling curriculum. Obviously, one podcast episode isn't going to get you to like figure it all out. What we're really trying to do, if you're a young married couple and you don't have kids yet or you have young kids or you're, you're just trying to figure this out, yeah. um, we want you to think of the education of your children as one of the great adventures that you get to go down where you mm -hmm. are going to be learn so much. Yeah, that's the cool thing. We want you to be readers. So um, we'll, <clears throat> we'll, we'll put a list of on our Patreon with the After Hours episode where we talk about effeminacy in education and raising boys and that kind of stuff. We'll put a list of books we think you should read. A few that I'd, I'd read, you know, right now. Ten Ways to Destroy the Imagination of Your Child by Anthony Eslin. We quote it in the cold open. You should absolutely read That's that book. That's a great one. You should read The Case for Classical Education by Doug Wilson. Um, we'll list some more books that you should read. Resources that would help you. Um, Dr. Schlecht is awesome. Yeah, he is. At NSA. Took a good class from him. Um, thanks for listening, guys. If you would like to join our Patreon and get, you know, our 1095 tier, I think, and up gets a sweet mug or T-shirt. If you jump on board there, we get you get access to all these after-hour shows, Ask Me Anything stuff. We got all kinds of things up there. And we try to put, like, detailed book lists and things up there as well. So, uh, and that helps us keep doing this. So thanks for, thanks for jumping in again with us at Bright Hearth. And uh, we hope that the Lord blesses you and yours and your household as you pursue godly, Christian, fruitful, productive homes. We'll see you next time.